Hello everybody and welcome to the second of our live panel discussions to celebrate the launch of the Big Book of Whole School Wellbeing. Uh, I'm Kimberly Evans and um, you can find me on Twitter on at Nourish the Workplace and on other social media uh, platforms as well and I have brought together some of my loveliest friends and some of my co-authors of the big book of whole school well-being and these special people helped me write the last chapter the last section uh, of which is called include well we will be focusing on include well to do with uh, pupils and staff so if you have any interest which you should do on either pupils or staff well staff well-being then please stick around for the next hour because I've got some wonderfully interesting questions to ask these lovely people and I know they have got some extremely wise words they're going to be sharing some of their insights some of the background behind some of their chapters but also taking it further because we know some of you have already bought the book actually scrap that we know lots of you have already bought the book because the statistics are going bonkers. Uh, so thank you so much if you've already bought the book. We really, honestly, do really appreciate it. And we all appreciate it, but also your staff appreciate it and your pupils appreciate it because that really makes you prioritise their well-being. Uh, so we want to bring you things that aren't in the book as well. So if you've already bought the book, please stick around because this is kind of like the extra bits on top of the book. We're having three panels throughout the week. We've had one yesterday. So if you're tuning in for the first time, please, after this, go and find yesterday's panel discussion. And then we have another one tomorrow at four o'clock as well. I'm going to be putting some questions to my panelists and they're going to um, answer the questions. And if you have any questions yourself, please put those in the comment section of where, whichever platform you're watching on. So if you're watching on Facebook, just put it as a normal comment. If you watch it on YouTube, then please comment below. If you're watching on Twitter, then reply to the live stream and then we'll be able to see your questions. If you use hashtag Big Book Wellbeing, that's up there to help you remember that way, <laughs> uh, help you remember. And then we can find it easily as well afterwards. And if we miss your question, then we can come back and answer it another time. Also, last bit of me talking is the competition. You may have bought your book, but I want you to have a think whilst you're listening to all of our wonderful authors, who would you like to give three books to and why? Because I have three books to give away this evening from this evening's panel discussion. The competition is running till Sunday, but for this panel discussion, we would like to know who would you give three books to and why? And again, you can put that in the comment section or reply to the Twitter post using the hashtag Big Book Wellbeing and tell us who you would like to give those three books to and why, and you might be in with a chance of winning three copies of our book. Right, let's meet some of these panellists. We have got Jen Beer with us today. So give us a wave, Jen. Jen wrote the chapter Language and Stigma Around Wellbeing. Uh, she is, as you can see, she is Jen NUFC boss on Twitter. She is passionate, she's a passionate advocate for children's mental health. She uses her BSc in psychology and masters in public health to apply a research-driven and collaborative approach to working with children, young people and families. Jen works in public health and has also worked with children's mental health charities. So she is really well positioned to be talking about inclusion and diversity, which is what we're focusing on tonight. Anita Kate Garay, say hello, give us a wave. Anita wrote our wonderful poem, which is at the very end of our book, which is a lovely bookmark for the end of the book. And I must just give a quick shout out to my brother who did the illustration, which beautifully sets it off as well. Uh, so Anita Kate Garay is a teacher. She's a writer, obviously, and a wellbeing consultant. She delivers emotional wellbeing programs to schools based on her stories and poems. Being With My Feelings are four illustrated storybooks and a guidebook full of ideas and activities for the whole school community, which is published early next year. And she can be found at her handle, Anita Kate, Gara, Anita Kate G, and Being With Our Feelings as well, which is also put on the screen. So then next we have, see this is a packed panel tonight. We've got, we've got Matthew Brooker and he co-wrote uh, the chapter, A Man in a Woman's World, with um, Chris and I. Uh, Matthew Brooker is a primary school teacher, primary school uh, 
sorry, primary school teacher based in Kent, who has held multiple leadership roles across Kent. He has a passion and drive to ensure well-being is at the forefront of all that he does. He is currently working on a programme which engages children, parents and school staff in furthering their own learning opportunities through blended learning. And you can find him at, at Brooker1M. And then we're going to go to Chris, who is wonderfully in his bright yellow t-shirt because <laughs> he is from from bright leaders uk so that's his company he again as i said before he helped me and matt Wright, a man in a woman's world he started his career as a pe teacher uh, he quickly moved into pastoral leadership and over 50 has over 15 years in this area He's the founder and director of Bright Leaders, which he is epitomizing this evening, a social, which is a social enterprise which uh, builds courageous influence, influencers through delivering leadership coaching and workshops to young people and educational professionals. You can find him on Twitter at Bright Lead Coach and Bright Leaders UK. And last but no means least, we've got Shabnam Anam, who contributed to the chapter Wellbeing in a Culturally Diverse Society. Hello. Hi. She's been in primary education for over 20 years, serving diverse communities as a class teacher, a SENCO, a head teacher, and a trustee. She loves working with the staff and communities to strengthen relationships and provision so that they are in the best position to be a positive force for all learners. Shabnam set up Dewdrop Education to share her expertise, support and challenge those who, like her, want to make a difference. She is currently a lead coach and lecturer at Leeds Beckett University, where she teaches on both undergraduate and postgraduate teacher training courses. And she can be found at Shabs Anam. So hello, welcome, everybody. And just to say, I'm going to stop talking in a minute, I promise. Our discussion tonight is going to run a little bit differently to our other panels, but that's because our section, Include Well, is different to the other sections in the book. So if you're one of these people that has already bought one of our wonderful books, you'll realise that there's a pattern to the book and most of the chapters do actually follow a very strict formula. We've kind of thrown that rule book out of the window for Include Well. Um, apart from Jen's chapter, for instance, Jen's chapter does follow those um, uh, follow those kind of um, constrictions. But we're all here tonight to bring you a little bit more on what we wrote, because we've got other chapters have got personal accounts, we've got interviews, and our poem. Remember, it's a wonderful section of the book. So we're going to focus together just on one main idea, the culture of diversity and inclusion, the culture of both home life and school and how that affects a person's well-being. And it's worth noting, remember, that we will be covering staff and well-being in this conversation because culture sometimes can be seen to be more of a pupil's domain, whereas actually, if you remember from when what we wrote in um a man in a woman's world and the cultural um, chapter that Shabnam contributed to, it actually has a huge effect on staff as well. So we're going to open with a general question. And to do this, guys, um, I'm going to ask for an uh, ask for an opener. So put your hand up if you're going to be brave enough to start. My opening question is going to be, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? Who wants to go first? Who's going to be brave? Right, let's go with Shabnam first. Go with Shabnam, then we'll do Anita. <laughs> I was going to say, I was, I was kind of fighting for first place there. Um, <laughs> diversity and inclusion, it's, uh, it, it's one of those phrases that, 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 you know, we hear being bandied about all over the place. Um, but to me, it is about the fact that we are all different. We all have differences and we are individuals, whether you're talking about your class or you're talking about your staff body. You know, often the word um, inclusion, people think about um, specific needs when actually it's every single individual has got some need and it's about making sure that we address all of those needs, not just because they have a label, not because they look different, not because of their gender or their, you know, their, their um, racial identity or anything like that. We each have our own individual needs. And that to me is what diversity and inclusion is about. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. Should we go to Anita next? Hi. 
Um, yeah, Shabnam put it beautifully. Um, maybe just to add to that, I would say that, you know, I think if the impact of knowing that it's sort of happening in a healthy way for me would be that um, everybody feels seen as they are and everybody feels accepted and acknowledged and valued exactly as they are. Um, yeah, that that's sort of how I would probably measure the impact of it. Absolutely. That, yes, absolutely beautiful. And I can massively identify with that as, as well. So, yeah, wonderful. Anybody else like to jump in with this? OK, we'll go Chris next. Yeah, for me, I mean, it's exactly what they just said. But for me, it's about listening um, and listening with, with, with ears, eyes and, and heart, really. Um, and I think listening is one of the most underrated skills and listening is a, is a really difficult skill that often we don't spend much time thinking of. We're ready to kind of listen to respond um, rather than genuinely just, just, just being there to, to, to listen. And I think when we do listen with our ears, eyes and heart, we're in a really strong position to support in a really inclusive and a di diverse way. That's wonderful, yeah. And we'll, the, the, we'll kind of lead into the, the question which we'll come on to in a minute later on when we've heard from, from other people. But we need to listen because we're not in there those people's houses we're not in their home life are we and we so we don't know we can we can we see what we see in the school in the school day but there's so much that goes on with children and staff that they're experiencing at home and we have to listen to them so that that we can understand that so that we can really then meet their needs yeah absolutely and really important point okay jen or matt who's next Go on, Jen. Jen just beat you, Matt. Jen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I couldn't agree more with what's been said. Um, obviously, and I think the listening thing is so key. It's it's absolutely paramount, really. And I think there's a lot of talk at the moment about sort of diversity and inclusion. And I, I I'm conscious. I work with a lot of schools that they can feel a sort of pressure to immediately sort of act upon things and and sort of tick tick off a list of um, actions that they need to achieve and I think what really matters with diversity and inclusion is that it's meaningful and that it's ongoing because it is there is no quick fix that's the thing there's no quick fix to to kind of improving situations there's just meaningful dialogue conversation and making sure all the time that you are listening you are asking questions if you don't know something then ask the question and link to that it's about it's trying to foster a culture and an environment of non-judgment, you know, an openness where people are willing to learn from each other and aren't afraid to ask those questions as well. Yeah, having openness and being, yeah, so people know who they can go and talk to, that, that is really, really important. Yeah, completely agree with you. Okay, Matt, so you've got the difficult one because five people have, four people have already said some fantastic things so far. <laughs> now you've got to, you've got to, you've got to say something um, that's different. <laughs> More poignant, shall we say. I, I don't know whether we can. Um, now, my friends here have obviously covered, covered it really well. Um, you know, the listening element is fantastic, you know, meaningful, purposeful love all of that. For me, it's just not having a glass ceiling, not having a barrier, um, not not limiting anyone um, if they don't want to be limited. You know, I think we spend a lot of time within schools really targeting diversity and inclusion. Um, but it's also, you know, listening to others. Do they want to feel like they are being included or are they happy with where they're at? It's that meaningful purposefulness. Don't just push someone into a box because they fit into a box. Um, just ensuring that you are listening to everybody, um, all stakeholders that you are, are looking after, um, staff, children, parents, carers, and just making it, um, making being very aware of, of your community um and not limiting them basically mm. yeah very very important and i think it's worth pointing out at this point as well because we didn't really say this earlier on is that um when we're talking about diversity and inclusion this evening and what really came through really i was really really passionate about making sure this came through in the book was that 
diversity and inclusion means many, many things. It is race, it is disabilities, but it's also gender, it's sexuality, it's religion. All of these things come under diversity and inclusion. And it's really important to make sure that we are addressing all of those things across our schools and really making sure that we're we're addressing all of the issues that come up for all of those things. Because I think sometimes it can we can go down, we're brilliant at doing one particular thing so you think okay okay we're going to really really concentrate on um on race in our school and making sure we're being you know really addressing the issues surrounding our young people in our school but then we are maybe then maybe leaving out some of the people that are having issues because of their sexuality or we're not really including everybody with all the different religions that are in our community. So I think we do have to be very careful that we are being re we are being inclusive of all inclusion, which is a which is a very, very difficult thing. We totally take on board that there are there is you know, you have limited times as educators out there. There is only so many hours in the day. You know, we totally take that on board and we are doing a book and panel discussions about well-being which involves your well-being as well but hopefully throughout the rest of the panel discussion we're going to come up with some really easy ways that you can that you can address these things in your school and the book gives some brilliant takeaway ideas all of the um all of the main chapters so gens one included if it's got the main chapters it's got an over to you section which has got places for you to think it's got and um, anita's poem has got actionable steps things you can go away and how you can use the resources that you've got in the book, how you can then go to school tomorrow and make a difference and make a positive impact to all of these things from all of these different people. So, yeah, while you're, you're thinking, thinking, you have to kind of think with your hat on of race, disability, gender, sexuality, religion, but also think with your hat on of pupils and staff. <laughs> it's, it's a lot to con it's a lot to get your head round. This is it's a really chunky thing. And to be honest, I think we could have written a book totally just based on this alone. Um, all right, let's do the next question. Uh, the first um, first main question then: um, How does the culture of home affect well being in school? How does the culture of home affect well-being in school? And Chris, are you okay if I come to you first for that one? Yeah, yeah, go for it. So, um, I mean, I think I think they're both interlinked in terms of what's going on at home, what goes on in your school, what goes on in school can can transfer into home, really. And, and, and for me, if I'm happy at home and staff are happy at home and the young people are happy at home, then they're going to be happier at school. If happier at school, then they're going to be happier at home. But for me, like my my most valuable pri like priority is is home, because I know that if I get home right, and if I can support other people, both both young and old, get get kind of home right, I know that they'll perform better in other areas. So for me, it's it's about having a good relationship with my wife, I and mean, I'm really proud of that. And it's about supporting uh, my two amazing children, and I know that when I get that right. I can perform better in in the world of work, and I think you know being being a, an adult, a working adult, is tough. It's tough, but but concentrating on those things at home for me, it's exercise. I've got to make sure I'm exercising. When I've got that right at home, I know I'm going to be better in school. Um, and when I'm not exercising at home, that's something that kind of depletes my well-being, really. So for me, it's focusing on the, the important things at home. Um, and when you get that right, I think you can have a, a better impact wherever wherever you go. So one of my jobs is is to support the colleagues that I work with and young people to just make sure that they've got some some like little bits and little moments of magic going on at home. Mm, that's lovely, and you're completely right. And it I think you do it very well because you're such a, a, a positive light for well-being and you share so many things on Twitter about all the good practices that you do for your own well-being. Um, I think it's really important as well, though, to remember that we need to be aware that staff members, for instance, might not be having on the other side of the coin, might not be having a very good time at home and therefore then how that's going to impact their job as well, isn't it? Because, you know, you're 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 in a brilliant place at the moment and then as you say that's making your job a lot easier because because of that but there's there'll be people in your staff now who are having a tricky time 
for personal reasons and to to allow that you know that we need to uh, allow it and understand it don't we because that will have a you know naturally will have an effect on their well-being in school and we can do loads of things for well-being in school but if we're not understanding and as you come back a bit like what you were saying before and listening Chris isn't it? it comes back to the listening and if you're listening correctly to your staff then you're going to be able to help them and to and I wonder as well whether or not you know people need to take on board that they need to signpost you know do they know where to signpost staff to if they're having issues at home because I, I think that that is our responsibility as staff would you agree Chris that is still our responsibility as, as leaders to be able to help with home life things by oh, oh absolutely and i think one and this is why i think listening like with with your eyes is is as important really because we've all been in that situation where we've asked somebody at work how are you doing and the response is yeah i'm all right and and you can tell whilst the words yeah i'm all right sound sound great but you can you can tell by the way they say it that there might be something un, underlying that so sometimes it's worth just saying are you all right waiting for the answer and he i know you said you're all right but that didn't sound like you were all right. And, and done in the right place, that can be a really good way of opening opening something up, you know, that's that's a little bit deeper, that's that's not mm. on the surface, really. And, and I think we need to move towards, and we're getting much better, move towards a place where and not only are we better at sharing when we're not all right, but actually being a better place of being there to, to listen for the answer if the answer comes back, you know, no, I'm not all right. I need I need five minutes. And I'd love to talk to you for five minutes. And I think being that person receiving, you know, that information is tough as well. And I think we need to think about how we prepare ourselves for listening correctly, because it's not about giving advice all the time. It's just about giving people space sometimes. And that sometimes that five minute space to offload can can really make someone's day. Yeah. Brilliant advice. Thank you, Chris. Um, Shabnam, can I come to you next? How does the culture of home affect well-being in school? What would you like to say? You can come to me. Um, I'm just going to, well, first of all, I'm just going to uh, kind of go on what Chris was saying there. And I love the idea of um, ears, eyes and and heart for listening. You know, I'm a big advocate for for authentic education. And 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 quite often that goes uh, with, with hands, head and heart education. Um, so this... This notion of being able to see, you know, and feel um, what's going on at home. I mean, the culture at home is 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 vital, and and for staff in school, and actually also for the you know for the learners in school to understand that that culture at home um, can be different. Uh, I mean, in the work that I do, you know, I, t I talk about deep culture we're quite often used to looking at surface culture and thinking that okay I've got you know um I don't know a child um who is autistic and therefore this is what it's likely to be like at home but that may be the case but then you've got to look deeper and and kind of what's going on in that actual home if you think about um, I don't know, ethnic identities, you know, we, we kind of have these, these sort of, and I, I'm not even talking about stereotypical views, but we might think, well, we make assumptions about how things are in a home. And actually, they will be very different to somebody else who might identify in lots of similar ways. Um, but our positionality affects everything. So that deep culture at home is, is, is really important to find out about. But something else that Chris was talking there, um, if you, you know, you, you ask staff, you ask children and you say, how are you? And they, they'll, they'll say, oh, I'm fine. Um, it just struck me because uh, I'm so I'm autistic. I have ADHD. And typically, again, you know, the, this is something that can happen that that um, learners, staff with that kind of neurodiversity will use I'm fine as a default because it is very difficult to um, sometimes to articulate how you're feeling. Uh, so being able to listen with your eyes and your heart in that situation is, is you know, it's invaluable, it's, it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, I, I think for me, it's about finding out those individual cultures, you know, what is the culture in that person's home? um what is it that that makes them tick what is it that's uh that, that's kind of 
causing them some anxiety. And that that requires time, which I think if we are trying to develop a culture of nurture and understanding in schools, then we've got to allocate time to that. Mm. And because it will pay off, won't it? You know, it will yeah, pay off absolutely. tenfold, won't it? The five minutes that you spend asking somebody a, a, a specific question, and maybe that's it as well, not just asking how are you, because they will just say fine. That is, It's just the British default, isn't it, to just say that. But if you ask a specific question, how did that essay go? Or how did that opener go? Because I know you had been working hard on those maths openers. You know, or, um, I, you know, I, I, that PE lesson looked hilarious. What were you doing out there? Can you tell me about it? Or oh, what have you got for lunch? That looks really interesting. Asking specific questions to people might, you know, that's going to help people open up, isn't it? And it also just shows that you value them. You know, I'm really passionate about that with staff. Get to know your staff really understand your staff get to know what makes them tick get to know what they like doing at the weekend get to know their food preferences you know things like that people value that don't they because it's important and then they feel valued as well um so let's try and move we're going to move on to how does we're going to change it slightly so we're going to come to jen and um matt in a second um and maybe um Anita as well, if you want to pop in on this one, um, how does the culture of school, how does the culture of school affect well-being? So how does the culture of school affect well-being? Who wants to go first? Go on then, Jen. Well done. How does the culture of school affect well-being? Um, well, in a word, profoundly. I mean, the culture is... <sighs> It is if arguably it's the most important thing, whether whether that be the culture at home or the culture at school or the culture in any sort of societal kind of group, it impacts enormously on well-being of everyone. And I think um, I think one of the things that I talk about in my chapter is around language. And I think it's so important that that's taken seriously, actually, and it links to what we've already discussed around how actually to have a meaningful sort of culture around mental health and well-being, you have to have an understanding of where everyone is at, where they're coming from, what words they do use to describe how they feel and, and, and to sort of articulate what they're going through. Until you have that understanding of where everyone is, it's very difficult to create a meaningful culture that everyone can kind of feel a part of and connect with. You know, if you sort of just, and I don't know many schools that would do this, but I certainly know many um, offices <laughs> that would do this. If you sort of sit in a room and try and write down a policy which will create a culture, it's never going to work. You have to have that dialogue with the children, with the parents and carers, with the staff within the school. Everyone has to contribute. And I think one of the really useful tools for, for doing that is to sort of create a vision, create a vision together with everyone around the table or representatives of everyone around the table actually contributing to that so that it's really sort of coming from every angle. And I think that that's really key. And I think another thing that's really key to sort of well-being in terms of culture is, and this links very much to what we were talking about before, is listening is absolutely key, but modelling is also really key. So I think um, in terms of when, um, when people ask each other, how are you doing? And everyone just responding with, yeah, I'm fine. I think there's also something really powerful in each and every one of us modeling a different response so if i say i'm having a bit of a bad day then the person i'm asking how are you might just feel that little bit more comfortable telling me how their day really is does that make sense i think it's just sometimes we need to give each other permission to sort of drop that initial automatic reaction of, of just yeah i'm fine and sometimes to do that requires someone else letting their barriers down a little bit. And I think that modeling thing is really key to sort of creating a meaningful culture. And actually just, so I won't, I won't keep, <laughs> keep going on, but actually in terms of the links between the school culture and the home culture, 
that again is why it's so important that we're speaking to parents and carers and the wider family. Because if we do nurture a culture within a school or education setting where it's okay to talk about your feelings and then a young person goes home and they're in a culture where it isn't okay to talk about their health or their well-being, then that puts them in a really tricky position. So we need to make sure that everyone is coming on that journey together. Um, because I've been in that situation, I'm sure many people have, where you have taken that courageous step of telling someone how you feel and you've not got the reaction you wanted. You've actually got quite a negative reaction. And that can prevent you then from telling anyone else again for years. It's that powerful. So it's so important that within the school, within families, that culture actually comes together and is brought together. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, and kind of on that line, it kind of um, leads a little bit into uh, the project that Chris and Matt helped me with, with the men's wellbeing. Really, really kind of, we create somewhere safe for people to say that. You know, there's, and we just, we try and funnel them into that, but there's a, a perfectly safe space for, for men to be able to come and, and do that. And there's never any, never any stigma, you know, going back to, you know, linking it back to your chapter, really, to, to try and break down that stigma of, of, of men and mental health, because you know, we need to be able to say, you know, I'm having a bad day, but actually it's not a hugely bad day. It's just a little bad day. It's just a little bump in the road kind of a thing. And, and modeling that is, is, is completely key. And I've started doing that with my daughters as well, because, you know, that whole, you know, we're, you know, lots of us are parents here that you say, how was your day? And they say fine or boring. And then that's it. And then they, they, they stop doing, I started doing something where I was, I, so I share when they get in the car and I rattle on for 10 minutes about my day. And what's now happened is that now my daughter rattles on for 10 minutes about her day because I've modeled that to her. I didn't, that didn't tweak until she was like 13 years old. And I've like oh, missed out on all of those days when she's coming home from school. But all I needed to do was just model how to explain how your day was, because we don't do that, do we? We don't, we don't really share our days with our kids. And we can, you know, then breaking down the stigma. And, you know, and also for people, you know, like people like you, Shabnam, to come on and say, I'm autistic and ADHD and this is what happens to me. You know, and this is, that's, it's breaking down that stigma, breaking down those language barriers of, of that's okay to say that. <laughs> you know, it's, that's okay. And it's good to say that because then somebody else will say, oh, me too. And, you know, and that's going to come on to our question we're going to have in a minute so I'm going to stop talking about that because otherwise I'm going to we're going to kind of divert off um Anita what do you do you want to come in with something on that and then we'll come to you Matt thank you yeah I've been taking notes our panelists are taking note on our panel that's even more <laughs> amazing <laughs> it's wonderful isn't it um oh I have yeah so much to say um a few things really um one is that sort of how are you question you know i'm really glad that was brought up because it's something that we just expect people to be able to answer you know how are you um something that i do a lot and i do a lot in my work and i teach about is just being a little bit more creative and open um and expansive as to the sorts of answers that we can give to that question so i sort of bring in the the whole culture i suppose of being able to answer that question with maybe a colour, maybe a sound, maybe a movement, you know, and for all of that to be as accepted um, as a very eloquently spoken answer, you know, so, and and again, the modelling, you know, so I could say, oh, I'm feeling, bleh. how are you? Um, so to model the fact that that's okay to answer with sounds and movements and colours, um, and that's not just for young children, you know, that's that's for everybody. So that's one thing I really want to say, and I talk about that a lot in sort of my work and my books. Um, and to the whole school culture thing, like apps, it really absolutely does need to be a whole school thing completely, you know, so that there's a common, there's an agreed sort of ethos, which my, what my teach, my, what I sort of teach is, you know, the agreed ethos is, we can all be with all of our feelings in this school. You know, we not there aren't any feelings that are pushed away or dismissed um, or judged. You know, there aren't negative and positive feelings. It, we're not all trying to be happy. Um, you know, sadness is is equally as accepted and acknowledged 
the feeling of numbness, the feeling of I don't know, all of those are feelings and they are all accepted. Not being able to answer the question of how are you, is an ex it needs to be accepted, you know? we There isn't a right answer to that question. The answer is whatever the answer, if the answer is silence, that's an answer in itself. There might be numbness there, you know? There's so, so I think just having, um, yeah, that culture of sort of non-judgment, acceptance, somewhere where everybody can take risks and experiment, um, you know, that sort of does absolutely need to be a whole school thing. Um, so I'm getting, <laughs> I have so much to say, do stop me. Um, another really, I want to just add, you know, that question about how does the culture of home, mm. to me, I immediately, I mean, I understand what home means, but I immediately also went to the definition of sort of at home within ourselves. And for me, you know, it starts there. Um, it's about, you know, can we include the diverse emotions and feelings in ourselves? Can we include all parts of ourselves? I'm getting a bit sort of deeper now, but you know, can we? Because I think that's, we can be with other people's um, personalities and feelings and things as sort of as much as we can be with our own. You know, if I can't be with my sadness and I turn away from it because it's just too much, I would find it very, very difficult to be with my colleague's sadness or a pupil's yeah. sadness. I would do the way, I, I, I would do the same. I would turn away from theirs. Try and she, come on, let's go, go and make ourselves happy. You know, I will do to them whatever I do to my own. So for me, it very much starts, uh, well, we can do it simultaneously. We don't have to get to a certain point in ourselves to them, you know, but it does start by looking at ourselves and making sure we put things, as Chris said, you know, at home, having things happening at home and in our lives um, around sort of mindfulness and meditation, or whatever it is that helps you to accept um, yourself and all the bits of yourself. Um, just checking my note. Yeah, that, that sort of... No, I can, that's it. lovely. Um, because I love that about the colours, you know, how mm. wonderfully inclusive for people with dis some disabilities mm. to be able to do that. You know, that's that, and it's such an easy thing, isn't it? just to be able to pick out a colour or come home and just show somebody a colour of something and that was your day is so much easier than using words, especially when kids come home and they're totally overwhelmed or even adults. You come in the door and you just don't have any words. We've all been at that stage, haven't we? And, you know, you just, you, there's just, I can't, I just can't talk. <laughs> there's just nothing cohesive coming out of my mouth. Um, so that would just be wonderfully inclusive, wouldn't it? That's that's brilliant. OK, uh, Matthew, so let's just remind everybody of the, the question. How does culture of the, uh, the culture of the school affect well-being? What would you like to say? So for me, um, part of the chapter I wrote was was really a personal experience, um, a roller coaster of my career so far. Um, for me, realistically, it's it's from from it emanates from top down. Um, I'm in a very fortunate position now um, where I'm working under an amazing extended senior leadership team. Um, I know that a few of them are, are watching tonight, so I'm not name dropping them. Um, they, <laughs> I've, I've they, spotted they, the comments. <laughs> they, yeah, yeah, they allow me the opportunity to be me. Um, so a few years ago, uh, before I worked where I work now, had a bit of a breakdown. The chapter goes into more detail about it. Um, and actually I needed somewhere to feel like I could be me. Um, I'd lost my way with teaching. I didn't enjoy it anymore. I wasn't passionate, wasn't driven. Um, and I needed somewhere to be able to express myself and explore who I was in order to deliver what I needed to for the children that I'm teaching. Um, and it, I don't think there, there isn't one way um, that we could sit here and say, this is the way that we're going to uh, create a, a world, culture of well-being for our school, because no one's the same within their schools. Um, even within the school that I'm, I'm working in, everyone is completely different. And what works for me doesn't work for somebody else. Um, I like to blurt feelings out if I'm feeling that way, um, but I know that it doesn't work that way for others. Um, it's about looking at that truly inclusive approach that we were discussing right at the beginning of the conversation and ensuring that we um, put that for our staff. Because um, for me, first and foremost, if we don't 
make sure the well-being of staff is sufficient enough, then there's definitely no way we're going to make the children um, feel the way they should be feeling and, and make them better citizens for the future. Um, they see so much in their little lives, um, particularly with the, the, the increased amount of social media, which is always a positive thing for us adults, uh, not necessarily for children. You know, I don't know. Um, we can talk about that another time, but they see so much in their little lives. And if we can't figure that out, how are we going to expect them to do it? Um, but for me, it's, it's a top down approach um, and a, a within approach as well, where everybody needs to be in it together. And it's not a one size fits all. It, that doesn't it doesn't work that way um i've worked in places that try that doesn't work and just linking back to something in need of saying with colors that is awesome um it works in my classroom i'm teaching 11 year olds um and we use the color monster amazing book awesome um not as good as our one but it is a good book but it works <laughs> for them to be able to express a feeling without you know, I see so many of these charts that you see in a classroom. I'm feeling this way today and my face is going to be on this chart. Um, no one really wants to put that out there unless they feel like they can. Um, as an adult, I wouldn't want to do that. I want to have something that's a little bit more subtle. Um, and that's something like using colours works perfectly well for a child just to have something subtle to show them. Um, and it you know, can work for adults as well seen it work for grown grown adults so but I think it is you know it, like I said it is it's not a one size fits all I don't think there is a perfect answer to this question um, and we could have 101 comments that tell me I'm wrong or that anyone else is wrong on this panel and that's fine because we're not in their setting um, so whatever works best for your setting is the way forward for you. Yeah, that's a really, really powerful thing for you to finish finish your little thing on, really, isn't it? Because it is. It's got to be a personal thing. It's got to be something that's personal to, to your particular culture. And, and we go into that with all of our different chapters, actually, about making sure that it, it's it's bespoke to your school, your setting, your classroom, your village, your town, your city, your country, your culture. It's, its you know, what's going to work for, for, for Matt's, um, Matthew's school is not necessarily going to work in the school where I teach. And, you know, all of those kind of things, they're not, you need to listen, Go, going back to things, everything else, we need to listen, we need to look, we need to understand, don't we? And really powerful comment about making sure that we're prioritizing staff well-being i can't go on about this enough that you've got to prioritize staff well-being absolutely first because all of you teachers out there you're all doing it for the same reason because you want to make a difference everybody in your school is in your school let's face it not because of the pay but because they want to make a difference to to, to people's lives and to be able to do that you need we need to look after them that's what needs to come first. And then they are perfectly equipped to then be able to go and make an amazing impact on young people. Absolutely amazing impact that they need to be right in themselves first. And that's, you know, again, uh, that's my passion pro project for again for another time. <laughs> so we're nearly, uh, we've got like 15 minutes left. So we need to rattle through the next question. But before that, I'm just going to remind everybody while you guys will take a breath, because that was like, whoa, that was big stuff. You were, that was, this is really good stuff. People are going to be glad they've tuned in. Um, remind everybody about the competition. If you haven't got your book yet, then why don't you enter the competition to see if you can get one? Um, this is our, um, our website. So the information to, about the competition is on our website. Um, it is also on all our social media channels. Who would you like to give three books to and why? So pop that in the comments to whichever um, stream you are watching. And we're going to be choosing the winner on Sunday. Who would you give three books to and why? So have a think about what you've heard so far. Think, oh, I know who could deal with one of those. I know who that could help. That's who I'd like to give it to. Um, and also, don't forget, we've got if we've got. 10 minutes at the end, we're going to be answering any of your questions. So if you're thinking about um, been listening and you'd like to ask some of our panellists a question, then do pop that in the comments as well. And that will come up on our feed and we can see it and we can feed back to you. But we're going to go in for a biggie next. And the next question is, how can we use representation to make positive changes? Now, this is huge. And I will admit, we had a discussion on our little on our little gang Twitter DM group about what this meant. And that's an important thing to say, that it's OK to ask. And if you're not quite sure about what representation is, 
to ask, ask the people in your school and say, do you feel represented? Do you feel included? And that's that's a really powerful question to have. Google it, find some images, work out what representation means, and then you can see whether or not you're doing it. So how can we use representation to make positive changes? Who would like to go first on this big one? Everyone's being everyone's being subtle. Okay, <laughs> let's go Shabnam first, then Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I mean, representation, people. Uh, again, it's another thing that's kind of you know it, it's becoming a buzzword, isn't it? You know, representation matters. Yes, it does matter, um, but it matters not just from the the point of view of somebody feeling represented, but also perhaps in a space where. Um, the makeup of the staff or, you know, the pupils, the, the, the learners that are in that organisation are a little um, less representative. That it, It's about having um, different differences, I guess, um, out in the open and on view and being talked about so that because if you're if you're struggling with something that um, nobody else or you think nobody else is struggling with then you're less likely to come forward and 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 ask for support for that and you know for your well-being to be um to be addressed and to be nurtured then you need to feel like you're you're part of something so um you know whether that's that's representation of your, you know, somebody else there who, who shares your sexuality or um, shares your gender presentation or shares your, um, you know, your racial identity, your cultural identity. Um, it's it's about making those differences um, visible, uh, you know. So and and that can have such an affirming um effect on 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 anybody whether that's staff um or whether that's pupils i mean you know you've got chapter about um what it's like to be a man in a woman's world you know because uh quite often in in teaching spaces um being a male uh, member of staff and and the expectations that come with that and then the limitations as well, you know, because of our expectations in society, we have to be aware of those things and just make it OK um, to I can't remember who it was who said that to make it OK to be who you are. Um, and that that for me is representation. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful words. And yeah, completely agree with all all and everything you said. <laughs> um, Chris, <laughs> off you go. Yeah, for me, it's about, um, I think, understanding self. Um, and I need to mention, like, your relationship with self, actually, is the most important thing. And I think when you have a, a strong relationship of self, it gives you and it opens the opportunities to understand others a little bit more. And I think um, what we, we, we've we got a duty in a personal, a personal level, I, I've got a duty in the way I see it, to, to explore my privileges, is, is to start really supporting other people um, and giving them a little bit of a, of a nudge, whether it's to do with the representation or the, the confidence. But I think it's about giving other people the platforms that sometimes they might struggle to, to, to get themselves. And I think one wonderful way to do that um, is I love storytelling. And I think storytelling is a really, really nice way to share ideas, thoughts, ideas and journeys. And I think through storytelling, that can give other people the the courage then to to step up and start sharing their stories and their struggles and their needs and and their visions for their future so i'm a big believer in storytelling and just to give you a little thing that i did last week and it it was like i was talking to young people about my struggles last week in a, in a secondary school the struggles that i had when i started secondary school um and when i talked through those struggles this the young people just started bouncing off each other sharing how they were struggling in year seven and I wasn't expecting that but what I learned from that was in me sharing my experience and the things that I found hard and, and my vulnerabilities at that time in my life it gave other people the confidence to, 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 to share and then once the young people saw other young people um, it just kept going and, and, and I've noticed that through storytelling with all kind of things and I think that's a really nice way to to start helping with representation 
Oh, yeah, I can totally understand how that would be incredibly, incredibly powerful. And and then really kind of links back to Jen's chapter, really, and our both of our chapters on on the on disability um, by um, Liz Wright and by Holly Evans. That that really would link it to all of it, wouldn't it? They're, they both said that they struggled with representation in their in their schooling uh, because there's too much of a stigma. Other people don't share because there's too much of a stigma. So if we can break down those stigmas and learn the language by reading Jen's chapter, then you can help with the representation of all so many people in your school, because there will be people there, other people in the school that are thinking, I'm a little bit like them, but I'm not quite sure if I am, or, or I wish that I could see somebody, or I, I, I wish I knew somebody I could talk to about who knew who, how I was feeling we need to break down those stigmas and those those language barriers so we are more open and more able to talk about people like that aren't we okay anybody else want anything to say anything about representation okay anita off you go i'd like to just add to that um yes storytelling poetry you know that i i just find that so such a powerful way and that was exactly what was behind the poem you and me that's in the book you know like each verse represents a different person with different interest needs you know some love school some hate school some want to be seen some want to hide you know there's teachers staff um people who've been through all sorts of things and in different moods and with different things going on in their lives and that that's exactly what's behind the poem is that you know i try to represent as many different possible um people um with different needs and all sorts of things so yeah just a little um so you know grab the poem put it up in you know on your walls and read them out read out all the verses and you know say which one do you you know and then the reflections are like which one do you you know is there something in there that you resonate with that you can recognize or you can recognize in someone else you know um i think that's so important to use stories um yeah It was me that did it, everybody. You all sorted yourselves out. You all did it brilliantly. It was me that fell into the trap of talking with my with my if I get my mute on. <laughs> um, talking using stories like Chris said, and a poem like um, Anita's just said, in itself is inclusive because we're using language in different ways. We're accessing people's thoughts in different ways. It's not just about having a conversation, a face-to-face -face conversation, which is intimidating sometimes. It's not about always having an assembly because I think sometimes these things just get put on assemblies and then it's like, well, no one's gonna share if you're in a room full of 300 people. You know, <laughs> that's never gonna happen, is it? You know, so just, you know, making it easily accessible. To, it's just a normal thing. We're just having an English lesson and we're going to read this poem because it's a beautiful poem. Or I'm going to tell you a story. We're going to have a chat at lunchtime. I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened to me. And then it, it's, it's, yeah, it's all coming back to the, the language as well. Okay, we've got seven minutes left. Does anybody else want to say anything about representation before we move on? Okay, Matthew, off you go. Sorry, it was beautiful to see that chapter um, from Holly Evans from a personal point of view. Um, you know, that was wonderful. Um, and it just reminds me back of, of all the teaching um, that, that, I, that I've done in previous years around representation and around inclusivity and around in celebrating those differences that we have in our classrooms. Um, I think that's born from a culture of how I was trained um, as a teacher and I was trained to ensure that differences are not something that sets us apart, that differences are something that actually bring us together. Um, because whatever my difference is to, for example, Chris, um, you know, we're different in different ways, but what my area that I'm not so great at is gonna be something that he's gonna excel at. And that's what's gonna bring us together as as a class, as a community, as a culture. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's idealistically that being representative of, of, of all um, and just ensuring that from the ground up, you know, anybody in that school um, can be represented in a way that they would like to be. Um, and, you know, re again, reflecting on Holly, Holly's chapter, um, and watching how she's progressed throughout her school time um, was rather interesting to see how 
you know, maybe it's not gone the way that she would have liked and would have hoped. Um, and it's ensuring that, you know, teachers, um, appropriate CPD, appropriate um, um, professional development for them is, is, is key just to making sure that they're not paying lip service to something. Um, just to say, look at this assembly, but ensuring that it's a culture as opposed to just something we put in a book for Ofsted. Yeah, absolutely. Because how lonely must it be to feel that you're the only one in the school? Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was, you know, that's what she said in one of the sentences is, and Liz did the same in her, in her, in her chapter, that they were the only one. And in a way, I know that that can't be the case. You know, we know the statistics. It's if in a, in a school of, over a thousand children she can't be the only autistic or adhd child there that it, that's not mathematically possible <laughs> so but she feels like she's the only one there and and liz felt she wasn't represented uh, represented or understood with her physical disability so yeah it's 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 all coming it's all it all intermingles into one it really really does isn't it and we really don't want anybody to feel lonely you know you'd hate that to think that somebody felt lonely in your school or whether or not they're a staff or a pupil wouldn't you but how lonely must it be to not be represented in in all sorts of things and we talked about this on our dm chat didn't we about it it could be even be that it's the posters on the wall not the children's posters but the staff posters if your if your posters about well-being have only got women then the men aren't going to engage in that well-being offer. Um, if there, if there, there's adverts about running, a rule with you know really skinny, healthy-looking people running, then somebody else who's never run before is not going to engage in that sport because they're not represented, and then they don't understand how they can access how they can access those things. So we do have one last question, which we're gonna, which is going to be, and I'll give you guys a little heads up a second for thinking about it while I just tell somebody what everyone one last thing for for everyone that's listening. What's one easy thing they can go away tomorrow and do that will have a positive effect on staff or pupils they work with? It needs to be concise, guys, because we've only got a few minutes left. So you guys think of the answers to that. Um, I'm going to tell all the rest of you. Don't forget to enter the competition, but also if you want, you don't want to wait till Sunday to see whether or not you've won, then there is a 30% uh, discount offer on the books. Wonderful if you'd like to buy it for all your staff as a Christmas present, remember, maybe. Or if you want to buy your heads them all as a trust leader, you want to buy all your heads the books, anything like that. Or if you're watching as a parent, because you're one of our friends, buy one for your kids' school, all those kind of things. The discount um, code is below. We have to go through sage public um sagepub.co.uk it's not a pub website it's a publishing website <laughs> um <laughs> and <laughs> that's all on ebooks.com because it is on ebook as well so that's valid until the 31st of december but also don't forget to enter the competition because you could win three and then you'd save yourself some money so our and don't yeah and check us out on our website as well so what's one easy thing they can go away tomorrow and do? Who's going to go first? Matt, you go first first because you've not been first yet. You go first. No, I was last last time. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happening. Um, be purposeful, be meaningful. Oh, and concise as well. I like it. Purposeful and meaningful. Well done, Matthew. <laughs> Who's next? Jen. Um write down two things that you're proud of that you've done in the last year because it's been a killer of a year <laughs> and sometimes we don't take the time to actually reflect back on how remarkable it is what we've all achieved that's brilliant yeah absolutely two things at least two things that you've done and so many people will have done such amazing things and maybe come back and share it share it with jen tag her in on twitter so that she can see tag us at edwell cole um do do the hashtag big book over um big book well-being and it, especially over to you that's our hashtag over to you as well is to share what you've used from the book so that other people can see so yeah that's a brilliant idea jen who's next shab off you go. <laughs> um, um, mine is to do with that that whole representation. I think whenever you um, you you meet somebody, uh, look at them as an individual and remember that there might be a whole lot of different things going on with them. Um, so you know to to always think there's the, there's not just this this one what you're seeing there are lots of levels and and uh, uh, you know um beneath the surface so yeah. make the time to find out 
yeah, make the time to find out. Brilliant. Anita, you've got 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm going to read the last verse of my poem. You see, we're all just doing what we can and finding our own way. We all need different things to help us get through every day. So let's be patient with each other and as kind as we can be. Because as I said, we're all just me and you and you and me. Oh, lovely. So be patient and be kind. Absolutely. That's a lovely thing. Thank you very much, Chris. So for me, praise and thank you. So as you go into work and tomorrow, as you flick on the kettle, go out of your way to praise one person and thank one person, both young person and adult, because that could be the start of someone's real start there for someone else. Praise and thanks. Oh, that's wonderful. And what a thing to end on, because then I'm going to say thank you guys so much. You've been absolutely amazing. Thank you very, very much. Thank you and praising you. You've all been fantastic. Thank you. I hope everybody enjoys. We've had so many comments coming through on the social media. So thank you very much. You have obviously inspired an awful lot of people. If you're only just tuning in right at the end now, give us a second and it's going to be available on replay. Um, so please do go back and watch because it's been an absolutely fantastic hour. It's been a pleasure, you guys. I could talk to you all night. But for our well-being, we're going to sign off. Uh, so don't forget to tune in tomorrow, four o'clock tomorrow's panel, um, and we're all available on Catch Up Afterwards. Thank you so much, guys, and a big well done. Bye-bye. <laughs>